right? So that's, that's extremely essential, right? Because unlike narrative research and phenomenological research, where it's you, the researcher, uh, making the final assessment, it's sort of your, your name, your seal of approval is going on the final dissertation or thesis or whatever it is research that you're doing. Um, in participatory action research, the solution is a collective solution. It's not an individual solution. That's another important point. I'm not going to put it up here, but you should know that by now, right? The solution is a collective solution, not an individual solution. And insofar as it is a collective solution, anything that goes wrong reflects, requires collective reflection. So collective reflection is obviously uh, a fundamental tenet to uh, particip participatory action research. Um, number three is it has to be mutually beneficial for the collective or individual action. Right? It has to be mutually beneficial. There has to be a mutual benefit. Um, you can have participatory action research which is led by multiple researchers. It doesn't just have to be one researcher. Typically, especially if you're doing, I mean, if you're a professor, it might be, you know, you and a, a colleague or two go down and do participatory action research. If you're a grad student working on your thesis or your dissertation, it's more than likely going to be the case it's just you. And if it's the case that it's just you doing participatory action research, you have to recognize that it has to be beneficial for you, for your research, but also the community, right? There is, in a very real sense, there must be a symbiosis between yourself and the community such that there really isn't this distinction between you and the community, the community and you, but that you become, at least for the time that you're within the community, part of the community. All of this entails um, immersion to the greatest extent. The greater the immersion, the greater you can be part of the community. For me personally, if you're doing participatory action research in a community and you don't know the language, I would recommend that you learn the language. If uh, you know the language, you'll be, you'll be more immersed into your research. You'll have a better understanding. Obviously, if you don't know the language, then you definitely need um, a translator, right? Or go to a community where you understand the language. So you really are trying to, as one of your goals um, in participatory action research, is to immerse yourself as much as possible into the community so that you have an understanding of the problem, right? The whole point of immersion is so that you get to an understanding of the problem because collectively it is in that process that you go about um, solution, right? So this research has to be mutually beneficial. Let me see. Mutually beneficial. And then uh, lastly, number four, um, there has to be an alliance building between researcher and participants, and that, that's just a given, right? There has to be an alliance building between the researcher and participant. Again, some of these aren't exclusive to participatory action research, just like with phenomenological research or narrative research. A lot of these um, overlap with all forms of qualitative research. Number four is something that overlaps with all forms of qualitative, all of the six forms in, that I'm going to discuss of qualitative research. There has to be an alliance building between the researcher and the participant. The participant has to feel that the researcher cares, that the researcher understands, that the research is there to help and not to tell. The researcher has to believe that the participants are smart enough to understand the problem, right? It's not the case that I'm going to entertain these indigenous folk or these people or the participants and really and truly I already know what's going on and I'm just going to impose my interpretation of the problem onto their community because no one understands the, the problem better than individuals of the community, for the most part. That could be wrong, but for the most part, you should at least go into the research believing that. If you go into the research believing that it's your burden, right, um, and you could be a, a black researcher going in, to, as a phrase, white man's burden. If you go into the research believing that it's my responsibility to help these naive fools of their problem, um, you're going to find that you're not treating your participants with respect, and you're going to be in a, in a very precarious situation, right? You don't want to be in a situation where the very people that you're helping, you're attempting, or you're alleging to help, you're not paying the proper respect to, right? This is a whole, Freer talks about the process of humanization. I'm not going to get into that. But you want to make sure that at all times, you see an individual in a Kantian sense as an end of themselves, right? I see you as a human being. I recognize you as a human being. Let's talk about your problems. Here's what I think I can offer. Um, let me know what you think are good solutions. We'll collaborate and, 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 and think of, you know, think of solutions. Where our solutions fail, we'll reflect on um, what we did wrong and try and do it better. And really and truly, that's what participatory action research is in that sort of, sort of laissez-faire sense, right? It's obviously more structured than that and so on. 
but this is an introductory account. The reason why I'm giving you these examples is because if you're interested in participatory action research, if you're con interested in uh, community building, community alliance, you know, community affairs, then this might be uh, the best uh, theoretical model for your qualitative research. So alliance building is important. All right. So uh, those are the four. Those are the four tenets of uh, participatory action research. The next thing that I want to um, discuss pertains to the distinctions between engagement and involvement, and it's important that this sort of hairline distinction is made because there is a difference. So uh, I'll be discussing that next. All right, so uh, let's talk about that, right? The distinction between engagement, B slashes between, between engagement So, what are the differences between engagement and involvement? Engagement in the research project addresses the research process, right? Engagement in the research project, engagement in the research project addresses, answers the research process, the unfolding in a philosophical sense of the research. Okay, what in the world does that mean? Anytime we're talking about research, and this isn't just true of, um, uh, participatory action research. This is true of all qualitative research, right? Anytime we're talking about the research, you have to recognize that the, the research itself is always, no matter what, even rounded theory, no matter what type of research you're talking about, right, uh, or, or what type of uh, um, research model you're talking about, qualitative research model you're talking about, the research is always going to be framed, right? And it's in the framing, and I don't want to go too meta with this, but it's in the framing of the research that we understand and we're able to identify the type of research. So, um, your research might be framed by the data. Your research might be framed by the analysis. Your research might be framed by the interpretation. Your research might be framed by um, many different instances, but your research is going to have a frame. Right? And, uh, the frames differ between models. When we're talking about engagement, um, the, the statement is that Engagement in the research project addresses the process, right? The whole process of research is to, one, acknowledge this frame or define this frame. Right? When we're talking about doing qualitative research, the first thing that you have to do is define your theoretical frame. Right? What is the theoretical frame of your research? If you're doing um, grounded theory, your theoretical frame is a product of your data. Right? Right? Your theoretical frame comes as a consequence of your data. Your data creates or serves as a condition for the possibility of your frame. If you're doing narrative, phenomenological, and so forth, your theoretical frame is applied to your data. Right? So whether the theoretical frame comes as a consequence of the data or the theoretical frame is applied to the data, you have basically two camps. Um, one camp saying that the theoretical frame is applied to the data. Another camp saying that the theoretical frame uh, comes as a consequence of the data. Um, I'm possibly going to do some research next year. I have a lot on my plate, but I might do a small piece. And I might even just do a lecture and give it out for free on sort of a Kantian account, right? Because this is obviously thesis, antithesis, and it's just a lot of going back and forth. Oh no, theoretical frames should be applied to the data, that's the best mode. Oh no, the data should drive the theoretical frame. And as a good philosopher, you want to see thesis, antithesis, and come up with a this synthesis. And the synthesis is, is obviously that's a bit of both. I'm not going to get into that now because there really isn't any research that exists per se that address that. If what I just said strikes your fancy and you happen to be a professor or something, you know, publish your article and let me read it. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm going to have time to get into research, but my interpretation on it is that it's a combination of both, right? To say that it's strictly the case that the data um, serves as a condition for the possibility for the theoretical frame, I think is a bit audacious. To say that the theoretical frame is solely going to be applied to the data and form the data, I think is a bit audacious. I think there is a bit of a, a give and take between it's both an inductive and deductive process, but 
we'll have to wait uh, till we get a little bit more uh, into the discussion. And I want to keep this intro friendly. I have to remember that. So that was a little bit over the top. I apologize.